So the Center for Africana Studies, along with the Wharton Sports Business Initiative, welcome you to our race and sports lecture. This year's lecture will also have a focus on gender. Uh, the annual race and sports lecture scheduled in conjunction with the Penn Relays every year was established in 2002 as a forum for informed discussion with prominent African-American athletes, sports scholars, and journalists. I remember that uh, back in 2002, probably was in 2001, when we were talking about the necessity of having a prolonged conversation on race and sports at the University of Pennsylvania. Generally, that idea was to be inclusive of a lot of different streams of, uh, of what's going on with race and sports. And, and I remember Ken had a particular, Professor Kenneth Sharpshire, I'm going to introduce him in one second. He had a, a, a specific idea of kind of making sure that this was broadly defined so that we would bring scholars, we would bring athletes, we would bring uh, people who were involved in the managing and administrating of the sport, people who were writing books about uh, sports and focusing on this dimension of, of, of race. But as I said today, we have the opportunity to extend it to, uh, to gender. The event has offered a forum for a very wide range of participants, including Tina Sloan Green, Kenny Wislow, Todd Boyd, Harry Edwards, Stephen A. Smith, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, Marion Jones, Wyoming Tyus, Bill White, Crystal McCurry, and her film Little Ballers, and most recently, Troy Vincent in 20. 2015, that was last year. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Kenneth Shropshire, who is the David W. Hawk Professor and Professor of Legal Studies and Business Ethics at the Wharton, uh, Wharton School, uh, which is located at the University of Pennsylvania, although people don't generally know that, uh, <laughs> as well as the director of the Wharton Sports Business Initiative. Professor Shropshire also has an appointment in the Department of Africana Studies in the School of Arts and Sciences and serves as acting director of, and has served in the past as acting director of the Afro-American Studies program from 1997 to 1998. He is the author of several books, several award-winning books, such as The Business of Sports, The Business of Sports Agents, in Black and White, Sports and the Law, Basketball Jones, and his most recent book, Sports Matters, Leadership, Power, and the Quest for Respect in Sports. His expert uh, views have been presented in the Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated, National Public Radio, and Nightline. Uh, he has served as special counsel at the global law firm, Dwayne Morris, LLP, working primarily on sports and entertainment industry-related matters. His consulting roles have included a wide variety of projects, including for the NAACP, the National Football League, and the United States Olympic Committee. Uh, he hosts the Business of Sports show on Cyrus XM Radio, and he has taught the Coursera course, The Global Business of Sports, which has reached 30,000 students around the globe. Uh, he will introduce our featured speaker, Ms. Katrina Adams, and our moderator, Professor Camille Charles. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Schrapfer. Thank you, Takufu. Good evening, everybody. Um, there are a lot of friends out here, so it's good to see everybody. And, um, and let me get right down to, to my task, which is to introduce two of my friends. First, I'll introduce our moderator, who I know a lot of you know, Dr. Camille Charles. She is the Edmund J. and Louise W. Kahn Term Professor in the Social Sciences, Professor of Sociology, 
Africana Studies in Education and Director of the Center for Africana Studies at Penn. Her research, is, her research focuses on urban inequality, racial attitudes, and intergroup relations, public opinion, racial residential segregation, minorities in higher education, and racial identity. Uh, she's the author of uh, a number of works, uh, articles, and books, including um, Won't You Be My Neighbor, Race, Class, and Residence in Los Angeles, and a co-author of The Source of the River, The Social Origins of Freshmen at America's Select Colleges and Universities, and of The Taming of the River, Negotiating the Academic, Financial, and Social Currents in Selective Colleges and Universities. Um, and I think importantly to this conversation, she's also a tennis mother. Yeah. So that will come into play in the conversation as well. Um, I'm very pleased, um, and, and when we were discussing potential speakers for this year, uh, Katrina's name was one of the first ones to come up. Um, and for those of you that, that watched the, the tennis world in, in her couple of years of, of leadership at the top level, You've seen her everywhere around the globe. And for those of you that follow her on, on Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter and elsewhere, uh, she, she provides us with some great insight as to the level of work that she does around the globe. But let, let me give you a little bit of her background and, and a little bit of perspective for people that, that don't understand how unique this is. I think, uh, especially here, too often we're focused on the NFL, Major League Baseball, uh, National Hockey League, the NBA. And we see the absence of leadership, particularly of African Americans at the very top. So it, it is really unique in, uh, I mean, maybe we could say golf, in the widest of the big sports uh, that we have an African American leader. She is the chairman and CEO and president of the United States Tennis Association. And in that capacity, you also serve as chairman of the US Open. So that, that gives you some perspective of, of the unique position that she sits in that uh, we don't have in any other sport. Uh, so she's the first African American, first former professional tennis player, and emphasize this for her, the youngest person to serve as president in the organization's 135 year history. Uh, so if you look around, especially in, in this Olympic year, at, at people that are leading these different uh, governing bodies of sports in the US, uh, it's gonna be rare USA Track and Field will be the, the, the one notable other place that you'll see African American leadership in sport. She played for 12 years on the WTA Tour. Uh, she was ranked as high as 67 in singles and eight in doubles. Uh, she won 20 career doubles titles, reaching the quarterfinals or better in the four Grand Slams. Uh, she was also in college uh, and I am reminded of what a great player she was in college. Whenever I go to Northwestern, where my son plays now, uh, where she is a, a legend, and you know, all these big posters of her are there, uh, including a, a doubles championship, the, the first African-American uh, doubles championship player in the NCAA in, in 1987. Um, among her other accolades, she was honored with the WTA's Player Service Award in 1989, 1996, and 1997. She received the WTA Althea Gibson Award in 2003. In addition, she was inducted into the Northwestern Hall of Fame in 1998, the Black Tennis Hall of Fame in 2012, the ITA Women's Tennis Hall of Fame in 2014, and the USTA Eastern Section Tennis Hall of Fame in 2015. And I, I think importantly, and if you, if you think about the, the theme of uh, being in the Wharton School, in 2015, she was named one of the 25 influential black women in business by the Network Journal and, and as one of Sports Business Journal's game changers. So uh, to, to connect sport with business has been an important part of, of her life. Uh, in addition to her duties at USTA, you, you may have seen her as a contributor on CBS Sports Network's first all-female sports show, We Need to Talk. And she also serves as an analyst for the Tennis Channel, where you may have seen her and is a contributor to Tennis Magazine and Tennis.com. Um, but she is still, uh, from her, I guess her Chicago neighborhood roots, uh, still in touch with tennis at, at, at the local level uh, as much as she can be, including uh, her work since 2005 as the executive director of the Harlem Junior Tennis and Education Program, uh, a national junior tennis and learning network chapter based in New York City. So I'd like to, to welcome Katrina and turn it over to Camille. 
Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so the way we normally do this is that I start by asking her a few questions. We have a little bit of conversation, and then we open it up so that you all can ask questions as well. Um, and let me figure out where, when are we shutting this down? So we have an app, an hour, 45 minutes. Okay. So um, I'm going to get to it. Um, so I want to start by asking you to just give us a little kind of biographical sketch about how you got to, to this place. What got you excited about tennis? What are the, the sort of big moments for you? Wow. We only have 45 minutes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. uh, you know, I, I would say that I was very lucky uh, as a six-year-old when I started playing. Um, I stumbled upon the, the sport. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club were, uh, had a summer activity every summer. That particular summer was tennis. My brothers were enrolled in the program, and my parents were um, summer school teachers. And uh, the program was for nine to 18-year-olds, and I was six. So I was a tag-along sister. And I realized after the first day that they didn't know what they were doing out on the court and that I would definitely go out there and show them what to do. But after uh, two weeks of begging my parents and the instructors, uh, and I'm a visual learner, when I was finally accepted on the court, I went out and started hitting tennis balls over the net. Um, and the rest is kind of history because I had people, some coaches that took me under their wing. <laughs> Fast forward, uh, it was actually the, the same summer that Arthur Ashe uh, won Wimbledon in 1975. And seeing him on a black and white 12 inch television with the antenna that you had to yeah. move around. I mean, you all don't know what that's about. Stand, um, right. But to see this tall, lanky, dark skinned man on television, I'm like, wow, you can play tennis on that? Not realizing what that was or Wimbledon. Uh, but it was a motivator for me at a very young age, not understanding exactly what that meant at that time or what Wimbledon was or what he had actually accomplished. Um, but as I moved through my junior career and understood the importance of it, um, for me, as I've progressed, it's always been about giving back. And as I've gotten um, to this position, I sat on the board for 10 years before I was appointed um, the president, and my number one goal is about giving back because somebody gave me that opportunity. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the culture of the WTA was like when you were a player? Um, uh, let's see, I was on tour from 88 to 99. So um, I was, an, again, you know, life has been great to me. Uh, I've been very lucky. My um, when I came on tour, Zena Garrison, who was eight or nine in the world at the time, uh, kind of took me under her wing um, and became my mentor. Mm -hmm. I literally traveled with, she, with her um, and her coach. Her coach became my coach. And so I, was, I had the opportunity to be introduced to the tour uh, by a veteran who kind of knew the ropes and I didn't have to try to figure it out, didn't have to create my own friends. Um, and Zena was there, Lori was there, Lori McNeil. And, and it, was, it was easy for me. I'm the type of person that can make friends with anybody. Um, but I had just won the NCAAs and the doubles the year before. And so tennis was my world. I, under, I understood what it, what it meant. I understood being uh, one of a few of people of color on the, on the tour because I went through that with college and, and the junior national ranks, et cetera. So that never bothered me. You know, I grew up in ATA. Uh, my first tournament was in 1976, the summer after I played in New Orleans, um, where there were, I don't know, a couple thousand participants probably down there from ages six to 96. And I'd never seen that many black people playing tennis. Uh, again, I just started the summer before, and the club at Lake Meadows was uh, primarily a black club. but. Having that family and then going out and competing, at least I had the best of both worlds. And so I never felt different. Um, so going out on tour, you know, I was easy to make friends with. And I was, I was, all, all, it was all about me and doing what I needed to do. So I never had uh, an, an issue, but it was definitely noticeable that I was one of a few. I would say when I came out, it was Zena, Lori, Camille Benjamin, myself, 
Um, yeah, I think that might be right mm -hmm. in that particular year. Um, so I want to, I actually want to backtrack just a little bit in thinking about you between the ages of six and, you know, in college and uh, ask about who your influences were aside from Arthur Ashe. Who were the, who were the players that you looked at? Um, it's very interesting. I was a, uh, a very aggressive player. I was a bully on the court. So I, I was serving volley, chip and charge. I wasn't trying to be hanging out on the baseline, banging forehands all day long. I was about finishing the point. So I would say at that time that the players that I kind of modeled my game after uh, would have been Martina Navratilova and John McEnroe. And um, I probably modeled myself after John a little bit too much because I was nicknamed Jane McEnroe by certain behavior that I displayed on the court. And there are a couple people in this audience that probably remember that, some of those displays back in the day. Um, and I learned very quickly that I, I had to get rid of that behavior. But those were the two players, male and female, um, that I really kind of modeled my game after at that time. Obviously, um, Arthur was playing or, or had played. He wasn't playing at the time. So I knew a lot about Arthur. I knew a lot about Althea and understanding um, the accomplishments that they had and, of course, wanting to, to be like them. So, you know, you had them on the pedestal and then you had those that were out there on the tour with you that you could really learn from by watching them not only perform, but watching them train. Um. I'm curious, I'm thinking about uh, what we know, which I'm sure is not nearly everything, about uh, Venus and Serena's experiences on the tour. Um, I think particularly with a lot of the, the negative aspects in terms of the response they get. And I'm curious about how what they experience now is similar to or different from what you might have experienced or, or others who were on the tour with you when you were on tour. Um, and potentially, if you, if you can speak to it, how it might have differed from black men? Uh, it's a very good question. You know, I want to say that I was sheltered because I never experienced it. And I think I never experienced it because of my personality and because of how I carried myself and what I either chose to ignore or didn't see. Um, you know, I had only one instance, I would say, in my career where I'd come off the court and I was a sweater, uh, dripping wet with my backpack on, trying to get through the, uh, you know, the barricade of where you go into the locker room. And I didn't have my badge on and I was, you know, asked for my credential and I said, seriously, does it look like I, what do you think, I just jumped in a, in a pool or a shower to come and do that? And then, of course, someone else said, no, 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 she's a player. And, you know, and the guy reluctantly stepped back and, and let me in. Um, that's the only time I would say at that moment, I kind of just looked at him and like, oh, okay, I get it. Um, I would say also growing up in Chicago in the Midwest was a very different feeling or experience than some of my other peers. And so I look at what maybe Zena or Lori might have gone through, and I've heard stories from Zena. Um, but you know, when you come up in the South, there's a certain level of alertness that you have of what you may have experienced at home. And so you bring that mentality out on the tour. I was never taught or raised to think that I was different. Um, you know, I, res I was taught to respect my elders and, and we were all one. And, and so I think that's, that stayed with me throughout my life, which helped propel me through the successes that I that I have made um, off the court. Um, so if you fast forward and you look at what um, Venus and Serena may have endured um, or what they've experienced, you know, anytime you look different or act different, people are going to look at you different. And for for Venus and Serena, when they came out with, you know, the beads and, you know, totally Afrocentric uh, look, it brought attention, of which we were proud of to say, yeah, you know, be you. Um, but I think a lot of the ridicule, unfortunately, that they receive 
was because of their father, who is a genius. You don't do what you do in getting both your daughters to number one in the world and number one and two at the same time without being a genius and a mastermind in, in creating that of what he and Oracine did together collectively in raising their two daughters who are brilliant, brilliant women um, today. And so it's very unfortunate for what they endured, but because they were so good and because they were surpassing and starting to break records, then that brought attention to them that much more than if they were mediocre or maybe top 10, but not one and two. So then you have the naysayers to say, well, how can you come in here and dominate our sport and this, that, and the other? And unfortunately, you can't control hatred. Hatred is very powerful. It's worldwide. You know, it's right here in, in every city here in America, as we see throughout 2015 and 16 in particular, of how I think it's going, you know, it's full circle and we're jumping back 50 years with behavior. But when you look at the experiences that they had on tour, only they can tell you what they experienced from their own personal experiences. We can see it from the outside and assume because of hearsay but only they can say what they've experienced. I can only speak for myself. Um, so I think staying on that topic a little bit, um, curious about the uh, comments that Raymond Moore made at Indian Wells this year. Um, and, and part of what I'm actually curious about is how, whether and how the USTA functions differently than say the NBA or the NFL um, in the way that uh, that the, the governing body responds to these kinds of situations, if at all, um, and, and how you... You obviously didn't see my response. I didn't. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I responded immediately. And it's on Twitter and, and Facebook it, it, and everywhere else, so you can find it. And is that something, though, that, because I have to be honest, you're, the, you're sort of the most visible USTA president that I think I remember. Um, and so I'm curious to know if, if that's something that is different about you and your leadership and um, or social, you know, the advent of social media and just that it has always been normal to do that and it's just that it, it's more No, I think, available. so the USCA is a national governing body of tennis, so we're not a professional sport. You know, we run a professional tournament, which is the US Open. And so when you look at the NFL and the NBA and all these other professional sports and whatever their, their responses may be, um, the USTA is all about uh, equality. We always have been when you look at the US Open for equal equality and gender. Um, and so to have a CEO tournament director make those type of remarks in this type of forum, sitting here and laughing with whoever was in the audience uh, was unacceptable. Um, particularly in this day and age. It's unacceptable, period. Right. But when you look at 2016 and say, wow, really, did he just say that? And he's joking about it? Um, and so my people reached out to me to find out if I had heard it, which I hadn't. Mm -hmm. it, um, I don't know where I was in the world. And um, I says, oh, well, go on Twitter. You know, go, go look to see what he said, and do you want us to make a response? And so that was the USTA and, and our staff being proactive and reaching out to me to make sure that I was aware of it. And then, of course, I immediately picked up the phone and, and said, here we go. Um, and so we, got a, we did get a message out. It must have been the next day. I know I was traveling the day that it happened. Um, but it's unacceptable. I mean, we're, we're about equality and, you know, it, we're about equal prize money throughout all of our men and women events that we have. Um, and you can't say that a longer men's match is more exciting or enticing or deserves to be paid more than, than a female match. Now I'm a former WTA player, so of course I've been fighting for equality and, and prize money for years uh, as a player and you know never wanted to settle for anything less than what we were getting and I continue to be an advocate for that for the players that are out there today. But as long as I'm in this seat with this title and I can do something about it, that's my, that's my ultimate goal. And I think from the, you know, when you look at it from, um, from being a female, you know, it's that much more powerful to be able to make that statement 
and to be able to speak on behalf of the organization. And actually, that is going to be my follow-up question, because I'm actually also curious to know if, if you get any backlash for being that vocal. No, people know me. Um, you know, I, I, get, I get a lot of, uh, as, as uh, Kenneth mentioned, I am on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter all the time. Of course, you always say these words are my own. You know, I, they are not the voice of the USTA, but I am professional enough to know what to put out there. And uh, I get a lot of support for stepping up and making statements. And so when I did make that statement and it was put on our website and on the USCA's Twitter and the USCA's Facebook uh, coming from them, you know, that, that meant a lot to a lot of our fans and a lot of our members um, who were appreciative of us making that statement or me in particular mm -hmm. stepping up with the quote. Great. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your, did you have a plan after you finished playing? So was this your, you know, your dream job? Did you have a, a strategy? No. Um, and, and I ask, I think, because um, I actually have a student who's a freshman doing an independent study with me, and she's interested in women in sports transitioning yeah. to leadership positions. Um, and so I'm very curious to know, given that there aren't really a lot of obvious paths for, for women to do that. Yeah. What, what your plan was? So I say no because this was not my ultimate dream job. Let's be clear, this is a volunteer position. Yes. I'm not getting paid CEO money. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, I don't look at it as a job. I, I make it a job because I, I put everything into it and, and I'm fully committed. Uh, when I retired, I actually became a national coach and I was working with our top junior girls that were making a transition from juniors to the professional ranks or aspire to make the transition. Um, and, and fresh off the tour, I had a lot to offer to them. I uh, was still physically able to be on the court and, and uh, beat up on them and show them who was still boss. And uh, you know, I did that for about four years. And Physically, I was breaking down. I said, you know what, I can't do it anymore. I hadn't had a break from tennis since I was six. And I was 30-something at that time, 34 or five. I don't know what it was. Um, and so I, I took a break and had to figure out what it was that I wanted to do next. Well, I studied communications at Northwestern University. So I was like, aha, I've got something else I can do. And I ended up going into uh, commentating with Tennis Channel. So. I was very lucky Tennis Channel had not actually gone on air yet. Um, and I would say December 2002, I went to LA where we had the, um, the WTA championships were at Staples Center that particular year and I went out there. And so I met with, uh, I went to Tennis Channel unannounced and met with a couple of the producers there and told them that they needed me. I didn't need them. And that was at the time when Venus and Serena were number one and two in the world. And so I, I used the race card at that point to say, you've got the number one and two player in the world who are black, so am I. I played, I know them, we're friends. So if you wanna get that interview, they're gonna do it for me, they're not gonna do it for anybody else. I said, you've been struggling trying to get interviews. So, I convinced them that they needed me more than I needed them, and that was really the start of that relationship um, and partnership and working with Tennis Channel. And so when they flipped the switch in April, I got a call maybe two weeks before to say, hey, what are you doing the weekend of April 10th? And I did have something scheduled, and I was like, um, nothing? And so they said, um, you know, how would you like to be uh, you know, our, our first commentator for Fed Cup, which was in Lowell, Massachusetts that year? And Venus and Serena happened to be on that team. And so we, uh, you know, I accepted. And when, when they flipped the switch on Tennis Channel, it was the first face you saw, which, was, uh, which said a lot. It said a lot for them in, um, in having faith in me. And I still work with them today on, on occasion. I'm a little busy right now to be able to be on, on TV every week um, calling matches. But... That was part of the path, and in that process, I joined the board of the USTA in 2005. 
um, as what we call an elite athlete. Um, every national governing body has 20% of their board are former athletes within 10 years of retirement. So when I joined the board, I fit that criteria. And uh, I, I really joined it because I wanted to know more about the USCA. I didn't really know, you know, when you're a member or when you're a player, all you know USCA is for uh, tournaments and leagues. You don't really know all of the good things that the USCA does when it's supporting programs like Legacy or Harlem Junior Tennis and Education Program uh, and thousands of other programs around the country. And so once I became involved um, on the USCA board, I said, wow, this is, this is way better than I thought. This is huge. I had no idea that this is who the USCA is. You only knew them as tournaments or the US Open. Um, and my ultimate goal at that point was to tell our story. No one knows, no one knew who the USCA was. Uh, people know more about who we are now, but they still don't get it because they either don't care or they're not looking to know anything greater than what they are. And so that was my quest as I got on the board and moved through the years and then um, aspired to go into the leadership role of it as an officer. Um, first, vice, first I was appointed vice president and then the first vice president um, and then ascended to the president. But it was all because at that point when I had a plan to say, you know, in order for me to really make a difference, um, I need to be the leader, that I need to set the vision, and that I need to be the face um, and ambassador of our sport to really talk about who we are um, as an organization. So that's how I got here. Okay. Um, so before I, I'm going to open it up for questions, but I think the, um, the last thing I'm going to do is you said we do have some kids here from Legacy Youth Tennis and Education um, over here. And um, so because we have some aspiring athletes and students in the audience, and actually I think we have some other um, alum from your program. Oh, we do. From Harlem. Yep. Here. Um, can you, what advice would you give them about juggling school and sports and social lives um, about taking care of themselves but also ham managing their priorities? Well, I think the, the first thing is to be true to yourself and understand why you play the sport and understand what it is your goals are. And also recognize that it's important to be the best that you can be, not to be the best that somebody else wants you to be. Because we can aspire to be a professional tennis player or number one in the world or what have you, but percentages are small. So you have to make every day your best day in order to improve on something. And as you continue to improve, those opportunities will present themselves and those doors are open for you to make other moves and to take you to that next step. So as a young player, the, the young ones that are out here, T and, and the others, you know, it's, it's not just the junior tournaments, but you know, they're gonna be going into high school and playing high school tournaments. I, People, you know, we have a lot of our top juniors that shy away from playing high school tennis. Oh, that's beneath me. No, it's not. It's another, it's another a check in your, in your goal setting, another check in your book. I won my high school state championship twice as a junior and senior. And because of that, now I'll, I'll sidetrack for a second. When I was a senior in high school, I was a young senior. I was 16. I graduated at 16. Um, I have a little brain up here. And so the college coaches, unlike the system that you guys have today with computers and everything, the college coaches didn't know I was a senior. They assumed I was a junior. But because I played high school tennis, the Illinois schools knew that I was a senior, particularly those in the Chicago area because I was in the paper often. And so Northwestern got on it very early. They started tracking me. I'm a junior. They started knowing that, you know, I, I really, and I, I'd like, I wanted to focus in communications. Um, it also helped that their men's team actually trained at the club that I played at because we didn't have a facility then. So our, our teams used to go out to local, local uh, clubs to, to practice. 
Long story short, she followed me. I went to what we used to call our national indoors for the girls' 18s. So I was a first year 18s. Not one coach approached me. And I, was, I went there thinking, ha ha, everybody's gonna come after me. I wanna go to USC, UCLA, Florida. I'm getting out of Chicago, it's cold. <laughs> so I thought, I was going somewhere warm. And you know, not understanding the system and that I could go and approach them. You know, I was told that all the, co all the coaches come to you. Not one coach approached me. So I was devastated, leaving there going, oh man, what am I gonna do? No one's approaching me. So my Northwestern coach was on it, and she's like, listen, she goes, Northwestern is where you need to be for all the reasons that she laid out. In January, I went on a um, college visit and committed pretty much right on the spot. Because one, I love the school. Two, it was close to home. I didn't want to be at home. But I love the environment at the school and the students that I had met. Um, they were seven in the nation, so they were a top school, and they were the number one communications college at that time. And so everything just kind of fell into place. And then, so that was my incentive when I was playing and playing all these other schools. I was like, huh, see what you missed on? Yeah, I'm gonna beat you up. I mean, I was, it was all about being competitive and going out there. So it's part of that process and those goal settings and understanding how things happen for a reason and, and taking you to those to those different heights. And you know, it's for these kids out here, know what your goals are and know that that path could change at any, at any moment, but it's for a reason. But you have to stay focused and you may not be that great tennis player. You may not be that, T, T, I'm talking to you, man. <laughs> yeah, I called you out. Know that you may not be the number one player in the world, but you got to work hard at it and you got to stay focused because you never know what those opportunities are going to be. And so I've got two alum here from my Harlem Junior Tennis and Education program who are freshmen. Now you're a sophomore. Freshman. Oh, yeah. Freshmen at, um, at Penn. And, you know, they're recreational players. They're not varsity players. But what they've learned through tennis and the life values that they've learned and the character building helped them get enrolled here at Penn and they will go on and do great things. And so I think that's the beauty of our sport that it's what you learn and, and what's being taught through, through tennis and building your self-confidence and self-esteem and time management, understanding what you can and cannot do to be successful, to be able to multitask. Uh, There's another young lady here that when I was a national coach, she was one of the nat one of my national players who went on to college and played at Duke. Played Duke. Played at Duke, another top school, um, competitively as well as academically, and and now she's working here. But it's you never know what that path is going to be, and I think that's for those of us that are running these programs or are working with youth. Um, if you don't have your youth in the sport of tennis, please guide them there because the opportunities are endless. Right. Um, and then just finally, what can you talk a little bit about the things that you're doing with the USTA around um, getting more kids of color playing tennis and what the, what the challenges are around making that happen? Yeah, I would say that we've actually done a really good job in our African American communities. Um, our NJTL programs are thriving and they're growing in number around the country. Uh, the stands for National Junior Tennis and Learning Network, which was co-founded by Arthur Ashe, Charlie Passerell, and Sharon Snyder in 1969. So it's now housed under uh, with the USTA Foundation, who are funding such programs around the country and trying to provide. Um, the younger programs with the resources to build capacity building, to get stronger, to be, be smarter in how they are running their programs. Um, and those that are meeting the task um, are receiving funding. And so we are, we're doing very well with our African American community. And, and you have to contribute it to the success of Venus and Serena, of what they've done in the last 15 years on tour. Um, when you look at our professional players now, uh, our top four are African American. You've got Serena, Venus, Sloane Stevens, and Madison Keys. I mean, really? 
And that's amazing. That could be our Olympic team. If that is our Olympic team, we've come a mighty long way. And it's, it's, it's very feasible. We've got a, a lot of other female players of color that are out there. And we've got finally some young men that are coming up. Donald Young has been trying to carry the mantle by himself for many years. Um, a young man, Francis Tiafo from Maryland, and Michael Moe um, from Florida are you know, making their, rank, their way up the ranks of the ATP tour. So it's about making sure that we maintain what we're doing there. So one of my main initiatives in, as president in growing uh, populations of color is really focusing on the Hispanic population. It's the fastest growing demographic in the US and it's the smallest percentage of players that we have. And so I've really put a lot of effort and energy in making sure that we can get these kids introduced to the sport or these families introduced to the sport for the long run. Um, and it's been, it's been challenging because uh, it's been successful as we had 12% growth last year um, with participation, which is a huge number. I mean, that's a big jump. But it's also been challenging because as many times that we may have a play day or we have these kids enrolled um, or participating in a particular event, it's been very difficult to get them to enroll in a program. Um, they're American, but their parent or grandparent may not be. And so they're reluctant on giving any kind of contact information so that a program like Legacy can, can reach out and, and bring some of those kids in. So that's been the challenging part. Um, we haven't figured out how to overcome that, but we will. And I think it's the more that we can put tennis in front of them and to show them how exciting of a sport it can be and the rewards behind it, then I think we'll start to get more involved. But it's, you know, when we look at our diversity and inclusion department um, within the USTA, the four pillars that they really focus on in diversity um, are African Americans, Asian Americans, the Latino, Hispanic culture, and then the LGBT community. And so, the more that we can get out there and show the good of the game, the more we can get people not only in the sport, but keep them in the sport. I'm going to open it up for questions now. We're not quite done, too. Oh, go ahead. You can applaud. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can applaud. See? Go ahead. There you go. All right. Don't be, don't be shy. I know, this, I, know, I know everybody is sitting on their hands because they don't want to raise them at once. Mr. Shabbos. Say I, I can't say how proud I am of you and the fact that the USTA, knowing their history, is going a long way. Uh, and, and there's still some growth. Uh, I did have a question that a lot of people don't realize. T tennis is a, the players on the court are just one aspect of what goes on in the entire, in the entire game. And, uh, you know, I watched the entire game and fortunate enough to have been involved in a lot of aspects of it. Uh, question for you, not to answer, but more of an awareness thing. Uh, on the officiating side, you know, a couple of years ago, there were a couple of lawsuits by African Americans uh, claiming discrimination. And uh, I noticed, unless I'm wrong, you correct me if I'm wrong, to my knowledge, there's never been an African American to chair or a semifinal or final at any of the Grand Slams. And, and I'm just wondering, uh, uh, knowing how many are out there and all like that, when that could be a possibility? Because in this day and time, that seems to be out of, out of kilter. Yeah, no, I, I believe Tony Nimmons chaired a semifinals about three or four years ago. Uh, so there has been someone in uh, a semifinal or a final you know, if you look at the percentages, the percentages of African American officials out there is very small. And you look at the process as to so many hours, et cetera. I mean, there, there's a formula there. But when you look at the Grand Slams, also, it's, you have international, uh, you have gold badge, silver badge, white badges. So the key is for them to be able to be elevated to gold badge to be able to do a semifinal or final, of which Tony is one. Um, the first year that we had a female actually chair a men's final. So if you look at that, not looking at uh, race, but just looking at gender, 
in all these years, you have the first female to call a final of a men's match in 2015. That says something. So hopefully that's changing. But the entire officials uh, system is actually being revamped to make sure that it can be more inclusive and provide more training, et cetera, for all. Yes. Uh, welcome, Katrina. Thank you. Uh, Don Ringel, Philadelphia Tennis Club. Um, wondering if the USTA um, sees value in developing a further relationship with the American Tennis Association, and to what degree, if they do see value? Uh, there's definitely value there. We've worked hard in the last few years with President Frank Scott, that's sitting in the front up here, uh, in building that relationship. We, uh, we collaborate on a lot of different uh, topics um, of sharing resources or providing resources. Uh, we actually have a symposium next week with uh, different leaders in the industry of which the ATA is being included in, um, in our USA symposium of Dr. Scott will be attending down there. So uh, the relationship is there and, is, and it's getting stronger. Come on, don't be shy. Any questions? Yes. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the equal pay issue that your uh, compatriots at U.S. Soccer are facing with their with the U.S. Women's National Team. Uh, I don't disagree. With? With what the U.S. <laughs> women's Soccer are asking for. You know, it's just they're, pl they're playing the same game, the same minutes, the same size field. Uh, they're the ones that are winning the World Cup year after year after year, and yet, you know, they're, I, well, I don't know the number, 40% less than what their peers are. You know, they're the ones that are growing soccer in America. It's more girls playing soccer than there are boys, uh, particularly Americans. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it should not be an issue. And I think for us in tennis, we're, we're proud to be the leaders in that, particularly with the U.S. Open. It's one, it's one event. Um, but it's to let them know that it is possible. We were the leaders. Now all Grand Slams have equal prize money for the men and women. Um, but look how long it took for a sport that's been around since the 1800s. So when you're looking at soccer, hopefully it doesn't take that long. But I think a lot of their peers, their male, their male peers, are, are in agreement with them. And hopefully uh, they'll be able to close that gap. Yes. So to piggyback on the soccer piece, you have, a, I guess, a counterpart in Angela Huckles. In who? Angela Huckles or Huckles um, of U.S. Soccer Foundation. You familiar? No. So she's the president of the, or was the president of the U.S. Soccer Foundation. Okay. And I was curious to know from the leadership side, you had talked about a young lady, a student of yours, pursuing studying females, uh, making that transition. But I was curious to know if the two of you had connected on something, especially since you quoted those statistics within soccer. Yeah, no, I, I have not connected with her. So uh, I'll make sure I Google and, and, and get on that. I appreciate that. I'm guessing there aren't many of you. Huh? I'm guessing there aren't many of you. Uh, in the leadership role? Right. Your mic is falling. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would have to say that in the Board, I'm probably the only one at the moment. I know WNBA, their last president was uh, Laura Ritchie, who was African-American. Um, there aren't many, and I think, you know, it, it's very difficult for people to recognize and understand that we are a nonprofit versus, right. you know, the mega, the mega sport, the top four that are out there, but it, it does transcend across the board. I am involved in a lot of C-suite meetings and conferences, et cetera. So being able to at least get my face out there and build relationships and understand how some of the other sports or other cultures are building or not, or growing or not, um, allows me to, to take a look at what we're doing and to make sure that we continue to be the leaders um, in that area, and, and I've been very fortunate and very honored um, to be, you know, the face of the organization. And um, you know, hopefully, it, it doesn't end with me. That at least the mentality doesn't end with me. Hi, Katrina. Welcome to Philly. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, quick question. It's really not a question, but I wanted to see if you had a comment. 
there had been some discussion in reference to, again, the equal pay thing uh, with both genders. And one of the issues were that most of the sponsors were not inclined to have men play best two out of three as opposed to three out of five um, that they normally do. But I've been told that that would never happen. But now I've been told that there is some conversation and referencing that, that they may consider now doing that. And I just wanted to know if you're aware of that. Uh, have there been any real conversation about it? Uh, grandstands will be in the best of five. I mean, that's what separates us from the rest of the tour. So there's no reason for the Grand Slams to uh, change that. And those are the tournaments that do have equal prize money. So it's more, it's more for the regular tour events that the men have made those comments, not for, not for the Grand Slams, but for their own Masters 1000s or whatever those tournaments may be where they're joint events where they don't feel that that's necessary because their level is a master one and then the women's tournament may not be their highest level tournament. Um, you know, that's, that's for the ATP and the WTA to, to work out. Uh, we, as the USDA, really don't have a say in that. Uh, we make our comments. We do have joint meetings with uh, what we call the seven leaders of the sport, the seven uh, the four Grand Slams, the ATP, WTA, and the ITF. And so um, on a broader, broader conversations, I'm sure that will start to come down the pike in, in, the year, in a few years. Thanks. Yes, sir. I would say that Serena and Venus are closer to the end of their career than the beginning. Would you give, what advice would you give them the uh, uh, rest of their career in terms of playing, advocacy, and so on? Uh, there's not one word of advice I can give to them because they are the best at what they do. They are business women. They have their own other businesses out there. So they could have walked away 10 years ago and still been the CEO of their multiple companies that they have. Uh, you know, I will say that they have been great leaders, particularly in the last, Venus has always been that. Serena has evolved in the last five years to really be the spokesperson that she is today. Um, providing positive advice and, and really uh, attending many more events and uh, activities than what she used to and understanding the importance of giving back. Um, you look at the school that she's opened in Africa and I think I saw her in Jamaica building homes for Habitat. Um, I mean, I can't give them one word of advice, but continue to do what they're doing because they've been great. Yes. In this area, we have a um, lack of women coaches, particularly um, women of color. Um, it's an issue. I've been in the coaches for 10 years, but I've always had trouble attracting um, female coaches. Right. Is that an issue that you see across the country? Yeah, it's not just here in Philly. It, the SDA is in terms of coaching development um, that you're looking at? We're definitely doing that. Um, we, you know, uh, one thing I'll have to say for Martin Blackman when he came in um, as our GM, he really started to look at, you know, the whole gamut uh, of coaching and development here in, the, in America. Um, he set out to do three symposiums um, within the first year. Um, the first one was uh, African American Coaches Symposium, which was in that December? In December that you guys actually attended. Um, the next one is in two, it's in three weeks, which is the Hispanic coaches. And then the next one is women coaches. And so it is very important to try to get more female coaches on a high performance level involved in, the, in our sport. But it's also very challenging and I understand it. I mean, I was a player, I was a coach. Uh, you know, we, we've got other responsibilities to in starting families and supporting husbands and all of that to really keep them focused. You've got one of the best female coaches sitting right behind you in Ann Coger, who's been doing this for many, many years. Um, and she's at Haverford right now. So, and uh, Tina's uh, daughter, Tracy, is, is at Harvard. So it's about commitment and what their own individual goals are. Um, and, and it's really hard to try to articulate why we don't have more. But even on the national level um, for player development, it's been very difficult attracting female coaches to make that commitment because of the hours that it takes. 
and it takes them away from their families. So hopefully we can change that, and it's just a matter of trying to find that balance. But they're sorely needed. Uh, the one thing when I started with Harlem Junior Tennis, there were no female coaches, and the first thing I set out to do were to get women involved because we need to have those mentors for our young ladies in the program to be able to communicate with differently. And so that those coaches understand what the girls are going through. Because you guys don't know what that little 12-year-old is dealing with on that day when, you, when you're all frustrated and you're trying to communicate with them and they roll in their eyes and they don't want to talk to you and you're just cutting them short. Whereas we are going to say, okay, yo, what's up? What happened? What happened to school? Well, come on, let's go talk. And then we can get them to open up. So it is, it is essential that we get more women coaches in the pipeline. Uh, particularly in our in, in JTL programs, um, because we really do need the, the guidance and the nurturing from these coaches, not as women, not just as teaching professionals. Um, I, first, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for coming out and uh, taking the time uh, to have this discussion. Um, my question is in return um, pertaining to uh, an issue. I'm on the wrestling team here at Penn. I'm a senior on the wrestling team. And so one of the issues that I find that we have in the sport of wrestling is that um, we have a difficulty attracting African-American youth to our sport where it's not as popular as sports such as football or basketball. So I'm wondering if in tennis do you guys have the same issue and what are some things that you guys do to tackle that issue of making the sport more attractive to African American. First of all, congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment. Wrestling is no easy feat. Uh, you've got to be very committed to doing that. So congratulations to you. It is. It has been a challenge for us. Uh, I would say we get the kids in the sport, but keeping them in after 14, 15 has been a challenge uh, across the board, across the country. Uh, you know, you see football and, and basketball and baseball on television every day. You see LeBron, you see Russell Wilson, you see whoever on commercials every day, even when they're not playing. So it's a lot easier for these kids to be attracted to those superstars that they're seeing on commercials or advertising, you know, a certain um, manufacturer out there to want to be like them. And we have been not as fortunate in tennis to be able to have our athletes on television more so than just when they're competing and in a different setting, in a fun, jovial way, or, you know, playing EA sports or whatever that might be that is attractive to youth. And so that's probably the same thing that's happening with wrestling because most of the kids in our communities don't even know what wrestling is because they don't see it on television. They don't have that superstar that's out there being an advocate to talk about the sport, to try to go and recruit uh, the young men to be wrestlers. They don't see it as a money-making opportunity, but when they see LeBron, that's all they think about are the you know, billion dollars that they can make building their own empire, but it's only one LeBron. Um, and I think that's the challenge that we have in our sport, and I talk about that often, but we as the USCA aren't responsible for going out and putting you know, the athletes on television. Everyone is their own business. They're in the, it's an individual sport. It's unlike you know, the NBA or NFL who can produce their own uh, commercials and advertising. So uh, more power to you and, and, and continued success. And hopefully you, know, you can be the one that's going out into these community centers and starting to talk to them about being introduced to wrestling or starting some kind of program or going to your local Boys and Girls Club or YMCA or YWCA um, and talk about, you know, getting some kind of wrestling program um, in these different community centers so that these youth can be introduced to them to the sport more. Oh, he, you have a question? Yeah, yeah I just defer to uh, the younger partner here. I think he did a great job asking a part of my question. A part of my question is about the plans that the USTA has for uh, growing the sport, because of course you're in a competitive environment with other sports, so how do you see the USTA growing the sport? 
Then secondarily, how do you see the USDA growing the sport in the urban areas? And then thirdly, what role do you think facility development plays in that? And is the UTA, uh, USDA interested in furthering facility development to help to grow the sport? Okay, so that is our mission. So we are growing the sport. Uh, you know, I would say under my administration, my focus has been on the Hispanic community, which has grown 12% in, in the last year. So that's a huge, a huge number for us. I think overall we've only grown 1%. So, and it's mainly because we are losing more people at the senior level and, and, and keeping them in. So, so the young, we, we're growing in the 10 and under. It's about making sure that we are keeping our 14 to 18, our high school players involved, which is another one of my main initiatives. I'm focusing on our high school youth, 350,000 high school players, and they're only in it for you know, the 10 week season. They're multi-sport multi uh, athletes. And so it's trying to make sure that they stay in the sport throughout their school year and into the summer, uh, even if it's just on a recreation level, but to make sure that they stay in it. Um, as far as our urban areas, we have our NJTL programs and they're growing. Um, there's often CTA programs, what we call community tennis associations that are developing um, in the urban areas that are trying to start up, start up programs or maybe transcending from our schools program. We, had, we have several schools programs, so that's helping to grow the game and trying to find a pathway so those kids that are being introduced to the sport in school or after school then are able to go to their local uh, program to stay in the sport. And what was the third? Facility development. Yeah, so we provide a lot of facility uh, grants based on the purpose, where it's located, the numbers, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's all about growing the sport and, and whatever we can do to do that. Um, it's there. I think a lot of people are looking for national. Everyone goes straight to national, and you don't realize that there's 17 sections. And so Pennsylvania, or Philadelphia in particular, is part of USDA Middle States. And so that's the first place that these programs should be going to for assistance, because they also offer uh, assistance and grants and things of that nature. And in order to really get a, to even get to national, your section has to approve that you are accredited program, that you're growing, that you meet all the criteria before you can even get to a national grant. And I think most people really like to go straight to national, not understanding the whole process, and that there are layers to help you locally in your city, in your state, and then in your section before, before you can get that national recognition. Well, we've been doing some of that in, in the community here in uh, our tennis director, Salim Ali, at the Strawberry Mansion Tennis Association, and we'd like to see that that support is more forthcoming because we have applied and didn't get grants from the middle states, so we would like to make sure that that's done. You, you said, what was the last thing? You are We're getting it? Sure that that's done more because we haven't been getting grants from middle states. Well, you got to deal with middle states on that. <laughs> I'm on a, I'd be happy to speak with you about that. I'm new to the middle states board, but I haven't. Um, had a chance to talk about it, but I'd be happy to talk to the right people and get your proposal and see what we can do to help you out. Well, thank you much. Pleasure. We have time for one more question. You laughing at time? Nothing. <laughs> Y'all got jokes? Like Go ahead, Tom, because I know you... You know, it's, it, it, it's great to sit here and we always, especially as African Americans, we always ask to... USTA and the WTA, what are you going to do for us? What I'd like to you know, establish is what are we going to do for ourselves? How are we going to come together as community leaders, as parents, and as black people to support our own kids instead of always asking what somebody else is going to do? I think that's the kind of dialogue we need to be having, especially today. It's not about what somebody else is doing, it's about what we're doing. We need to become more passionate about this tennis thing. We need to make sure that our kids get into these programs. We need to make sure that we stop distrusting each other and come together and support these kids and build our own facilities. We've always been able to take a pig's ear and turn it into a pocketbook. 
And that's what we need to do today. We need to stop looking outside of our communities and outside of ourselves for somebody else to solve our problem. And we need to concentrate on solving that problem ourselves and be sincere with each other and start to trust each other and pull our resources together and change what's going on in tennis. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, for someone who's built, someone like you who's been successful in building your own empire and, and really relying on the community and, and each other, it's, it's important to get, out, get that out there because I think because of the success of what the USCA has done, uh, you'd be surprised that people look at us as an ATM. And it's all about what you can do for us and, and how much can you how much can you give to us? We're doing this, we're doing that. But it is a collective effort and it does start in the community first. And it does have to, it starts from the ground up. And that's why we talked about grassroots before you can get to national to really start to build these facilities and, and, and prove them. Um, but you've got to get the community support and people to buy in right here in Philadelphia, um, since that's where we are, um, to support your programs and your initiatives. You know, I'm going to the Legacy Youth Tennis and Education Gala is tomorrow night because they've got to raise their funds for to sustain their program. I had my Harlem Junior Tennis and Education Gala on Monday night, this past Monday. Um, and it's about what we're doing within the Harlem community and working with each other. It's not about me or my program reaching out for USCA all the time because we are a dime a dozen, and I think it's, it's really important that these relationships continue to grow uh, amongst ourselves within our community. So thank you for that comment. Please join me in thanking Ms. Katrina Adams and Dr. Camille Charles for an excellent conversation. <laughs>I've been tasked with also announcing the final program of the Afri Africana Studies program for this year, for 2015 to 2016. Uh, and it will take place on Monday, May the 2nd. And I will be discussing my latest book, African Independence, How Africa Shapes the World at the Penn Bookstore, which is located on 36th and Walnut. Uh, this program is free and open to the public. Uh, we want again to thank all of you for taking uh, some of your time and joining us this evening. Thank you very much.